So this is the second of the transportation talk shows that are being live streamed from COP23 here at the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Bonn, Germany, uh, with the president of uh, this president is uh, Fiji. And of course, we are at the wonderful headquarters of DHL in the Post Tower, the beautiful venue. Thank you so much for hosting us. Um, the aim of these talk shows is really to share what's happening here at the COP. Uh, there are 20,000 estimated guests here, um, but of course they're all versed in what's happening um, with experts mulling around trying to, to move along the negotiations post Paris Agreement. Um, but we want to share what's happening here beyond, beyond the hallways, um, and especially to link the transportation issue to all of the, the various other issues that are important to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, special thanks goes out to the host of this, which is uh, PPMC, the two partners of PPMC, the Paris Process for Mobility and Climate, and that's SLOCAT, and the Michelin Moving, Moving On initiative. Um, before we continue and, and welcome our first guest sitting mm -hmm. beside me, uh, a couple housekeeping rules. Um, please, if you have phones in the audience, uh, turn them off or put them on mute so that you don't disturb. Um, and second, if you're listening out there in the in the live stream world and you'd like to submit a question you're more than welcome to please send it into hashtag we are transport that's hashtag we are transport mm -hmm. and if you're here in the room and you'd like to ask a question you can get in touch with my colleague here in the front room or front row <laughs> and um and uh ask a question or just raise your um raise your hand near the end and what we should have time for that we hope all right, so tonight's theme, every night uh, we are doing these for eight nights and we have um, various themes and tonight's theme is sustainable mil mobility for all, both in the broadest sense, but also there happens to be an initiative dedicated to this in the transportation world mm -hmm. and we have one of the board members here, Clayton Lane from, <laughs> from the uh, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Thank you so mm -hmm. much because I've, slandered, I've, sl I've slaughtered it too many times. <laughs> um, and sustainable m mobility for all tends to have uh, various concepts behind it um, and this mm -hmm. initiative in particular has four pillars I'll let yes. you to sort of describe what they are maybe you can go into the objectives of this yeah. initiative yeah. how progress is going it's, it's certainly shaping up quite well yes it is um, so sustainable mobility for all is a consortium of over 50 leading uh, organizations in the transport sector and we've come together to consolidate a vision for sustainable transport, uh, indicators to measure that, and then to consolidate an action plan. So what we as a world, as cities, as countries, as companies need to do uh, to really achieve that vision. So we're really trying to distill the, the parts of the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, the new urban agenda, uh, the transport portions of those agendas in one place in sustainable mobility for all. Right. What so does it mean for the transport community? Because there's yes, all these really large exactly. global frameworks that yes. have been hammered out by governments in the UN, et cetera, for the Sustainable Development Agenda, the SD 17 Development Goals, yes. the Paris Agreement on Climate, and the new Urban Agenda, which you referred to, which is really dedicated to the urban, mm -hmm. uh, the growing urban uh, phenomenon basically mm -hmm, that it's the mm -hmm. fastest growing uh, community mm -hmm. space let's call it right. <laughs> um, okay and so the this initiative I understand has sort of four objectives it does, do you want to go does, into yes. those a bit sure sure um, so the the four big pillars or objectives as we call them are uh, climate or green mm -hmm. uh, efficiency uh, universal access um, so <laughs> I have and, to remember, safety. and safety and health. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so th those four pillars really yeah. cover the breadth. And yeah. I think what's so strong about this is the diversity of the organizations. Uh, yeah. You know, it's development agencies and banks and NGOs and the private sector all coming together around these themes. Um, and so recently, you know, we, we've been working together as a consortium for nine months. And already within these first nine months, we've just recently published a global mobility report. It's the first report ever. Um, that assesses the performance of the, mob of the mobility sector worldwide. Uh, and it shows that, uh, that we're very off track. And, and, oh no. and it's okay. urgent uh, that, we, that we take action to get ourselves on track. Okay, yeah. and so uh, can you tell a little bit more about the report? How are we, and uh, there's some representatives here, so mm -hmm. maybe they don't want to hear that they're off track, but <laughs> how, are, how are we off track? Uh, how is the transport sector off right. track on, on safety, on efficiency, yeah. on reducing emissions? Actually, on all of these topics. All so right. let's just take okay. greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions, <laughs> right? All right. So um, as many of you know, uh, the transport sector already comprises 23% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. 
and that is expected to grow to around one third of emissions by mid-century under a business as usual scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the fastest growing sector of emissions. We need to be reducing emissions across all sectors, so the fact that it's growing is uh, of great concern. Uh, so we're, we're increasingly uh, satisfying the growing need for moving people and freight at the expense of future generations. Uh, and, and we have an urgent need to change that. The cost, the cost of mobility in terms of congestion, um, uh, road fatalities, pollution, um, greenhouse gas emissions and so on is just too great and it's growing quite quickly. Right. Yeah. So um, you mentioned safety and maybe we yes. can go into a little bit sure. about that and then I'd also like to ask you about mm -hmm. some of the regional differences because I understand mm -hmm. that um, you know some some emissions are sort of plateauing in some areas mm -hmm. despite uh, you know measures some are projected to decrease mm -hmm. uh, despite increased use of vehicles, um, emerging mm -hmm. economies, et cetera, making good efforts. Right, um, right. So I'd um, like to unpack that a little bit. <laughs> but um, you mentioned safety. Yes. And, uh, and that's actually, a, uh, there's interesting work happening there. There's growing mm -hmm. concerns about, you know, as infrastructure is developed, as cars are being, there's innovation and automation, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, what, what are some of the findings regarding safety in the global mobility? So currently there are about 1.3 million deaths per year, in addition to many injuries related to traffic collisions. Uh, that's now the largest uh, leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 29 years old. That has been the case for men for many years, uh, but now that's true also for women as women are, are traveling more and in the workforce more around the world. Um, and, and that's just traffic collisions. Uh, we also have to talk about air pollution, about physical inactivity. Together, these three transport-related causes of death uh, c comprise about seven million deaths per year. Yeah, I yeah. understand that's about a thousand a day. Yes, it's, it's about a thousand a day. It's, it's very dramatic. Yeah, yes. it is right. And I understand that in certain um, age brackets, it's actually the first, it's the leading cause right. between 15 and 19. Exactly. And, and even when you look, if you sort of cut off, mm -hmm. ch you know, infants, it's mm -hmm. between the first and third Mm -hmm. leading cause of death from anywhere from five-year-olds to 24-year-olds. A, a dramatic impact, yes. Yeah, so and, and you talked about regional differences for a moment, so yeah. let, let's mention that just on safety. Um, so, in, so these indicators of safety, of greenhouse gas emissions, are starting to bend in a more positive direction in more developed countries. Um, or at least plateauing in some cases. But in less developed countries that comprise the vast majority of population, especially urban population, uh, we see uh, actually a, a rising trend, very, very concerning. Um, and, and largely in terms of safety, this is because uh, you know, more than half of people in cities of Africa and India walk and cycle and, uh, for their daily trips. Right. And that's still about a third or so in Latin America and China. So what yeah. can be done? So let's go to some solutions because, sure. you know, there are so easy <laughs> solutions. I mean, in some of these, there are, you know, uh, s uh, traffic calming measures right. that can be in place. Or how, what are some of the sort of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, simpler, you know, yeah. or, or less uh, simple tactics that, that, that governments or partners can right. be working with governments on implementing? Well, I, th I think there's, there's a wide variety of things we need to do, but one very key thing that, that cities need to take the lead on with national governments is massively expanding rapid transit. This is essential. Uh, not only is rapid transit safer, it's obviously much lower emissions, it's easier to electrify large fleets as well and really reduce emissions. Uh, to help cities grow in a compact way requires rapid transit. And there's a huge gap. Uh, right now we see that, um, that the, the large majority of urban residents don't have access to rapid transit, especially the poor. Um, uh, Curitiba, Brazil, for example, it is, uh, it's famous for its bus rapid transit system, right? right? But only 13% of the poor actually have access to rapid transit. And that's only about a quarter as much as the wealthy. And when you're talking about 13%, how do you get to jobs? how do you get to health care, uh, educational opportunities, and it's no wonder that when incomes start to rise, people choose, households choose to buy motor vehicles, two-wheelers, or cars, and that's what's really driving this huge increase in emissions. Absolutely, yep. and, and, and that's the, that's, um, we're going to talk a bit more about that sort of, what does it mean to have mm -hmm. access, what is access for, you know, mobility for all, what mm -hmm. is that, let's really exactly. unpack that, because yes. that's very, very complicated, and, and uh, it's one thing to have, you know, for example, you know, like you're saying, sustainable transportation, but who has access to it, what does it mean, where is mm -hmm. it going, um, exactly what you're saying. There's really yes. good examples of it, but, so, mm -hmm. and, and leading to that, you work, what is another 
hat you're uh, right. wearing Right, so my, here my other hat, so I'm not only with Sustainable Mobility yeah. for All on behalf of all these organizations, um, I also am the CEO of the Institute for Transportation and yeah. Development Policy. Mm -hmm. So we're a global NGO uh, with staff around the world, uh, with offices in seven countries, really working with cities to help them implement some of the best practice uh, concepts and then spotlight those as lighthouses of inspiration for other cities to replicate. And can you give an example of sort of what are some of the good work you're doing on the ground? Sure. Um, and I'd say it's really, it's the cities themselves that are doing the, the really good work. But uh, so some really exciting examples recently, Chennai and Coimbatore in southern India, both have committed themselves uh, to 80% to complete streets. What that means is that 80% uh, of all arterials in the cities will have a proper places for walking, for cycling, for, for public transport, for parking, for private motor vehicles, as opposed to today where it's basically, I mean, if you're a pedestrian in these cities, uh, it tends to be a very hostile environment with pollution in your face and it's very difficult to cross the road. Um, women and children are disproportionately affected by these issues. So that, that's been a, a policy um, uh, measure, but now the cities are starting to implement that, actually building the sidewalks, uh, building the cycle lanes, improving transit. And, and this is part of the Indian Smart Cities program. So these cities now are becoming more examples for others to follow. That's great. That's really, really exciting. Great. I remember a study a long time ago, I will intervene, is that, um, that they were t showing about bike lanes, that mm -hmm. if the, just the difference between a simple bike lane with no barrier and mm -hmm. one with a barrier, mm -hmm. the increase in use by right. varying ages, and, and of course women and men, uh, it just was exponential if you just put in a simple barrier between mm -hmm. uh, the, the bike lane and the traffic. That perception of safety is so important. And you know, we, we've seen dramatic increases in cycling in cities that have taken very proactive steps. London, for example, 15 years ago, it was hard to find a cyclist on the streets. Today, cyclists will soon outnumber automobile drivers in the daily morning commute. There's a resurgence, absolutely. And yes. yeah, we've a, there's so much potential <laughs> there. Um, all right, we have to wrap up, but sure. I think you were warned that you will be, uh, you have one final question, which all of our guests are receiving. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, we're going to compile them. Mm -hmm. Remember, your answer does not have to be all inclusive. No we know that there's no silver bullet, but in your particular mm -hmm. area of work, what is a specific pragmatic action that can transform the transport sector right now? If I were to choose one thing, yes. it's simply for cities to grow in a compact way, meaning with, with dense land uses, mixed uses, very transit and, and pedestrian friendly. Uh, that improves social equity. Uh, it reduces emissions because we can move around more easily by walking and cycling and public transport. And it also uh, helps improve public safety uh, because there are fewer deaths when there's uh, fewer miles driven in cars. Excellent. And uh, what is the, we had, yeah, excellent idea. And I <laughs> fully agree. So, I, I, you know what, I was second that one. Thank you Good. so much. <laughs> Please stay, uh, stay here for one moment. We're going to um, have views from the street next. But I want to thank you so much, Clayton. That was thank very, you. very thank informative. You. Thanks yeah, for joining us. Fun. Thanks. I know you've got to run off to a steering committee meeting. Um, so our next uh, intervention or our next uh, element here segment is going to be views from the street. We're, we're trying to capture views from those of you who can't join us here at these talk shows and tonight we have two uh, views from the street one is from I think her name is Julia from yes Julia from the United States and Zal from Bangladesh so we'll cue those up while we uh, transition for our next panel sustainable transport means to me a shift away from carbon dependent vehicles and public transport whether that means moving towards electric vehicles and public transportation or um, things like cycling in cities. Um, sustainable transport, the way I perceive it, I would like to see that uh, all people, uh, they have the access to the transportation system which is efficient, uh, which will not harm their ultimate future, which will not harm the future of the next generations. So sustainable transportation is the system which will provide transportation to the people uh, without harming people.
Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much. That was uh, Views from the Cops. So we're gathering. Uh, if you happen to see one of my colleagues uh, tracking you down to interview you, please do stop and give us your views of what does sustainable transportation mean to you. That's just a small excerpt of the interview, and we're going to put full, um, the full interviews online. So we have our uh, final panel here, which is not final because it's going to be in-depth uh, conversation about what does sustainable mobility for all really mean. We had a great overview from Clayton, um, but our, our next guest is going to do a little bit more of a deep dive of what does that actually mean for people um, on the ground. Um, we have uh, right here Heather Allen and Gail Jennings and uh, Sebastian Rood, and I hope I'm pronouncing all of your last name correct? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, I'll let you uh, say first just a little bit about um, when I ask you to speak, we'll talk, you can kind of say, what are you doing here at the COP? Because that's, many people are wondering why on earth there's 20,000 people uh, gathering here. Um, so Gal, we're gonna, we're gonna start with you, if that's okay. Um, so you heard uh, Clayton talk a bit about sustainable mo mobility for all. Um, and many people often confuse that with uh, low carbon mobility for all. Could you just sort of break that down, the difference? Well, low carbon transport, as we know, would be uh, transport that is kind of obviously lower in carbon or zero carbon emissions. But that's, that's not necessarily sustainable because, as we know, transport is not something that people want in and of itself. So the purpose of transport is, is access, really. So low carbon transport doesn't necessarily deliver that access. So when we think of sustainable transport, we think of, of transport that contributes to some kind of sustainable community, sustainable livelihoods, enables you to have the access that you need to live the life that you need to participate in your community, to have access to economic opportunities or healthcare or community engagement. So that is a crucial difference. Sustainable transport delivers on a kind of sustainable livelihoods agenda. And what is tricky about that is that that doesn't necessarily only involve the transport sector because to deliver access you need to work closely and often with, with contested and scarce resources with land use, with, with education, with healthcare, with a number of other departments to deliver this more holistic service. And, you know, in a nutshell, to, to paraphrase a colleague of mine, what, what sustainable transport really is, is that we need to think of, of um, you don't need to, we need to deliver access not to sustainable transport, but via sustainable transport, because the point is what you are going to, not how you are getting there. That's a really good point. So low carbon is transport, which many mm. people think about. Sustainable transport just means being green. Mm. And, and you're saying it's really much more of a holistic vision of, of a, a livelihood as a way of mm. thinking about how we are mobile to a sustainable lifestyle that includes economic justice, uh, opportunity, a viable uh, world, really, like mm. economic opportunity, health care education, et cetera. It's a, it's a more holistic mm. view. Um, can, you th can you think of a, a sort of a practical way of describing that or, or a good program that's, that's, that's um, maybe implemented this? It's, sadly, it's easier, <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to think uh, of. Challenges <laughs> out there, the challenges out there. How it or hasn't been implemented. Or, or, um, you know, or even a good partnership, even a good partnership that you can think of where, you know, or what does it look like to you? It's, it, that really is a difficult thing to answer because, you, because one of the challenges is that in, in particularly many of the developing world cities where, where a lot of, of investment is going toward building low carbon transport interventions that are, would be regarded as sustainable interventions if they were perhaps in a different city context. But there, there are many circumstances where the rest of the services haven't changed. So you would be in a situation where you might now travel the same route that you used to travel on a, on a perhaps lower quality mode. So you will travel that same route, but you will access the same poor quality service. So it's, it's really tricky because you need to work with everybody to deliver the end product. But if we're working in the transport sector, then we're focusing on the on the transport mode. Yeah, so and I think I think this is a, um, maybe Heather, you were going to speak a little bit about also sort of that holistic planning concept of, mm -hmm. of taking into consideration 
um, that all of all of the the different needs of the community and maybe thinking a bit about that planning. Um, we're going to go back to you about mm. the big question that we're at the end, but we're going to ask all of you. So so maybe we can put some thought into that. Um, Gail, before we did that, do you do you have anything else you want to add about sort of the the difference between them or the challenges ahead, especially from the developing you, you from? We South can get to that when we get to the the big question. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> So, so Heather, she was talking about the, um, the, compli the, the real challenges out there to have this sort of holistic planning, and uh, we hear about this for all at the end of sustainable mobility for all, and a lot of this speaks to this access point. Can you, can you help us uh, unpack that a bit more? Well, I, I think it's been really, it's great. First of all, I, I wanted to thank um, uh, PPMC, Moving On, Slowcat, and DHL for hosting these talk shows. Because, I mean, we're all here in Bonn, um, but there are plenty of people out in the world who are able now to hear what we're saying, hear what we're discussing, hear some of our thinking and our thoughts and where um, you know, some of these big picture items are really going. So I really do appreciate that and, 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 and thank that. And, and thank you, Tracy. I know you're a great, you're a great moderator. Um, so yes, I think, um, Gail, you really clearly um, showed how transport also gets caught up in words. So we have sustainable mobility for all. Of course, you can't have sustainable mobility if it's not for all. And I work a lot on the gender aspects um, and looking at uh, how women use transport, how women um, might not use transport, and particularly in terms of public transport. Women use public transport more than men. They have done for years, and yet you tell me a public transport system that is specifically designed more for women to use than for men. The typical kind of character that the public transport system is designed for is very often a man, very often employed, and he's doing those work trips. Whereas the way women use transport is completely different. And this has been documented for years and years. But do we take any notice? No. So that's really one of the things that I think we've got to. We've got to this tipping point in transport now between sustainability. You have to have the complete holistic approach to achieve sustainable transport. You have to have the environmental aspect so that it's low carbon. You have to have the affordability. Uh, you have to have it affordable for passengers, but you have to have it affordable also for cities. You can't have the most expensive, all singing, all dancing, chrome-covered, chrome fast, high-speed rail um, in every city. It just isn't affordable, but you can have much better than we have at the moment. Yes, um, yeah. And so, and so and the social you, side, yeah. let me go into, I mean, yeah. the social side. Yeah. At the moment, there is a huge piece that is missing on the social side of sustainable mobility. Um, Clayton talked about this very, um, very important and, and, and uh, very, um, uh, how can I say, whole, uh, inclusive kind of approach for sustainable urban mobility for all with these 50 organizations. But really what we have to make sure that this organization, this partnership delivers on is that it changes the current paradigm because we have to change that paradigm. And the way we're doing it at the moment is not delivering on climate change, it's not delivering on the economic side, it's not delivering for youth, and it's certainly not delivering for society. Yeah, and I think, I think a real practical example of that is if you do design for all users, you're going to increase usership of public transportation, for example. If you're, if you're bringing it to the broad community, you're going to increase the usership. Definitely. And as, you know, ec you know, as people are more economically empowered, they're less likely to buy a private uh, personal vehicle if they actually do have a, a public transit that responds and serves them as it should. We've seen this in, yeah. in, in Manhattan, in London. People don't buy cars any longer. If, if the services actually respond to their needs. And, and that's the challenge, though. And b but so, so the practicalities are you actually have to s um, survey 
-hmm. truly the people, and this is what gender considerations have always been tackling is, where's the data for this? How do you do mm -hmm. sort of home surveys or user surveys, et cetera, that are, that are re truly um, reflective yeah. of the community? It's, it's, not, it's not easy, it's not easy no, to do no, this, no. but the transport and infrastructure community uh, for a long time has been saying a bridge is a bridge, but a bridge is not a bridge. You need to design it so that the users are, are kept in mind. It's very, very true. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So are there, um, Clayton was talking earlier about safety. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, youth are particularly vulnerable, but there are other communities um, that are vulnerable as well. Um, and we were talking a bit before the show about that. Do you want to add anything about sort of the the um, a more social uh, um, perspective on the on the safety dim dimension? Definitely. I mean, safety is is absolutely key. It's really um, uh, one of the, the the biggest killers, as Clayton said. But in terms of gender. Again, women pay highly for this. So they pay in terms of climate change, but they also pay a lot um, when it comes to road safety. Not only are they vulnerable because they walk a lot, low-income women walk uh, most of the time, in fact. They walk with children, so that makes them very vulnerable on very poor infrastructure with no sidewalks and, and fast traffic. Secondly, they themselves may lose a loved one, young men, as we know, they're the guys that get killed. Um, they may be, particularly again, for low income women, they're not in the driving seat. Um, they are hit as a pedestrian, but if uh, they, they, they lose their breadwinner as a, the man very often, then they have to take on that role. And thirdly, they have to look after the injured. And the injured figures are far higher than the fatalities that Clayton Moore talked about. Mm -hmm. And they are really, really stunning. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, there, there's, a huge be there's a huge societal impact about yeah. race safety, road safety, which goes beyond the technical side. Huh? Yeah. Uh, the good news is, uh, th is that for solutions, do you, uh, there are some really, pr there's some simple practical measures to increase safety, um, including building sidewalks, including, you know, uh, like I said, traffic calming measures. Um, uh, I adhering to having regulations on speed and enforcing them, of course, drunk driving laws, et cetera, that can really uh, help to improve safety in, 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 the, in transportation. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, the short list that I just provided, I'm <laughs> exactly. sure there's many, many more. <laughs> well, speed is usually the biggest killer, that's for sure. Um, yeah. that, that's, that's for sure. And the second, the second one is to have decent infrastructure. If you have cities like Chennai was talked about with complete streets, if you have good pedestrian infrastructure, people walk huh? and they enjoy walking. It's not just walking as a transport function, but it's also as an enjoyment. Yeah. I mean, Las Ramblas in, in Barcelona, people go and they walk. Huh? Yeah. Uh, it's not just only um, for the function of stopping cars getting into the center of cities. And let's face it, in historical cities, a historical city that you can walk around, and there are many in the developing world, is a joy. Yeah. But it is an absolute nightmare if you let city cars into it. So yeah, it's, you know, how it's, it's, it's how it's managed. It's how it's managed. Um, thank you very much. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna move to our third uh, uh, guest, and then we're gonna come back and have uh, we can comment on each other's uh, interventions. Um, uh, Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us. I think uh, you. you are the uh, board member of the European Youth Forum. Yes. Y uh, European <coughs> Youth, Youth Forum. Forum. Yes. Thank you. And. Um, uh, you're, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're doing here at the COP before we go into sort of the youth perspective, if you will, on transportation and what priorities should be for the international community or governments. Yes, excellent. Uh, together with many youth delegates from all over the world, we're here to also remind governments, corporates, other NGOs that climate change is already killing. It is not a future issue. Yes, it's a future issue because it will become bigger and bigger and bigger. But this climate, change is, uh, climate crisis is happening now. And therefore, we need to act. I mean, it is, it is blessful that there's a partnership for low carbon uh, extinction. But at the same time, if you're breaching human rights just a little, as we are doing all at this moment, if you're doing it just a little, you're still doing it. It's not green, it's a little bit less gray. So basically, we're here to remind people that the urgence is here. We need to act now. We need climate justice now to make sure that <coughs> everyone is stepping up their game. So that is yes. what especially uh, we youth representatives yeah. are trying to remind people to 
Yeah, you're basically bringing the intergenerational principle, which is a legal term, <laughs> to <Yes>. life. <laughs> yes. Reminding us that this is truly a, an intergenerational phenomenon that we're all responsible for. And thank you for reminding us of that. Um, and when it comes to transportation in particular, I, I imagine, I mean, I know we all, I'm a little older than you, know, than you and um, uh, we all have our views on sort of what is the perspective of youth you know, when I was young, when you were young, and, and but I'd like to, we'd like to hear sort of, uh, you know, what are the trends that you see, and especially by your community, uh, you're sort of, you are a representative of, so what, what, what are the sort of the trends that you, um, that you hear or that, uh, regarding transportation? What would you like to see? Well, basically, three things. And the first thing, we need to strive for not only low, but zero. So we need to ask for ourselves, do we really need to travel? Do we really need this product? Then secondly, if we need it, what's the most sustainable uh, way to do so? So, for example, through the partnership of low carbon transport, that would be better than by one of the competitors who are not having the mandates, not having the ambitions to cut down their emissions. And then lastly, if you are emitting, make sure that you compensate. Secondly, I think it's for our generation, we are used to having fast innovations. Basically, 20 years ago, nobody could imagine that we have a computer basically in a pocket. And at the moment, everybody's having it. So I think we should also be more ambitious. Don't think on the frameworks of today, but th think already in the possibilities of tomorrow and make sure that you set those ambitious goals. Set those goals ambitious for the future. And lastly, I think it's important. I think the goal of the partnership is very, uh, 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 is very excellent. At the same time, show us also what the competitors are not doing. Because if I see a shirt that has blood on it, I'm not buying it. Whereas if something is green, but everyone is claiming that they're being greener, more sustainable, what as a consumer, what as a young person, do we at this moment see that it's actually happening? So, yeah, so that's really interesting. So uh, the youth are very, you know, they've done studies on consumerism by generation. And um, youth, like under, I think it was the, like under 30 roughly, um, consider sustainability to be the number one criterion by which they, they purchase. But that's what they say. But actually then, but when it comes time to purchase, they don't necessarily have the dollars at that age to, to put their money where their mouth is. But still, it's interesting that that's a principle by which um, uh, in surveys, they say that's that's the principle by which they will consume in developed yeah. states, and so if that holds true as they age, that is a real force of change. That is a real th there's real potential there for what you're saying is you know if corporations are honest in reflecting what their measures are, and we're here yes. we you know we've heard from companies who have, are doing great work, and if if they're held to account or they held themselves to account. Yes and they're transparent about that, there's real potential for consumers to, and, and the cycle of change to start happening where they are, are forced to the front and the others fall behind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's great to hear that, that I, you know, you're, I think you're speaking the truth and that's been proven in, in a lot of surveys. So um, that's excellent to hear. And w the, you're talking about like avoid, we've heard avoid, shift, and uh, improve, which is avoid transportation, shift to green when you can, and improve what's left. And, and you added the offsetting bit, yes. which is a, a bit complicated. Not everybody's you know, a fan of offsetting right now, but where, where you absolutely have to travel or you can't find another way, sometimes uh, offsetting is a way to do yes. it. So excellent points. Um, before we move to uh, the final question, um, did, did anyone have comments or want to add to, to each other's bits? Yes, yeah, Heather. I, I have a comment on the avoid, shift, improve. Uh, yeah. you know, that was a concept which is a, a, a policy framework developed about seven years ago, which was great. It was really good. But let's move on from that. We have to move on to the easy framework, which is enable, avoid, shift, improve. If we don't have that enabling piece in there, if we don't have the options for people to make the chances, if we don't make it easy, if the policy is not there, um, we need to make it a possibility. We have to put the enable in there. It's the access part. It's, it's, it's the you access. You can't avoid it if you don't have any. Connectivity. Yeah. It's the whole sustainability bit. Very good point. <laughs> Very good point. I, I, I sense that's missing as well. So yes. that's I, I would agree. Uh, anyone else have, before we do the final big question? Basically what you were saying in transparency, I think that is key. Mm -hmm. At this moment we're talking about a lot of uh, about corporate capture at COP. But there are also a lot of good companies that are doing a marvelous contribution. For example, also 
name a company like Trilos Bank, who is making uh, sustainable and ethical banking key and offering an alternative. But then again, we need greater transparency, uh, transparency to hold companies to account. If the transport sector is really responsible for a quarter of all the pollution when it comes to the CO2 emissions, that's basically one fourth of all the CO2 emissions in the entire world, which means that a quarter of the human rights breaches that climate change is causing is coming from the transport sector. And I think if we are honest about what we're doing, and also making sure that the transport sector within itself holds each other to account and is transparent, then consumers can make a decision. Yeah. Whereas now we can see it's good and better in yeah. instead of bad and yeah. less bad or bad and good. Yeah. For, uh, you know, fortunately, there's there's some really good uh, work being done by different monitoring and reporting groups, coalitions. Yes. You know, on, on carbon disclosure, in various industries, and yeah. and that uh, framework is you know they're they're sectoral in some cases, and in others they're just basically any you know collecting thousands of companies, uh, reporting yeah. and, and and standardizing those metrics, um, and that space is really shaping up. I, it's been doing great work in the past few years, and hopefully it will improve so that consumers and and other service provide everyone can be more transparent about what the private sector is doing. So yes. there's a lot of potential there. But also, I think <coughs> I think if you're doing a good job, you should not be afraid uh, afraid to uh, to name and shame your competitors. Show that it's not only good what you're doing, but show that what the others are doing are causing great human rights breaches, are causing massive impacts. Because if you're only saying, oh, I do such a nice job, people are like, oh, lovely. So there's like, I spent, uh, I spent extra money to s basically between good and better. It's not about good and better. It is about good and bad. And if you're doing a good job, then be proud of it, but also show yeah. the difference. So yeah. again, here, here, basically on everything that you were saying earlier, as well as inclusion within transport. Yeah. Enable people, make sure that people can make the decision. Because on the st in most of the stores, you don't see when a product is bad. You only see it when it's good or better. Yeah, Consci conscientious bad. consumerism is definitely a, a way of the future and, and enabling informed decisions, uh, including on transportation, is going to be increasingly important. Yes. So yeah, very good point, very good point. Um, hopefully, you know, uh, there are people working out uh, <laughs> working on this in various aspects and the, the work is cut out for them absolutely because metrics is very important transparency monitoring it's very important and hard work um, all right we're going to wrap up with one hard question each and remember um, there is uh, no silver bullet we don't want to hear there's no one silver bullet because together all these answers will become a bouquet of solutions <laughs> and uh, uh, let's um, <laughs> we'll start with you Heather okay. um, and I'll ask the question once, and then we'll just go down the line. Okay. So in your area of work, or what you care to answer in, what is the specific pragmatic action that can transform the transport sector right now? Mm. Can I have one in my area of work and one not in Aww. my area of work? OK, mm. so in my <laughs> area of work, really, sh really quickly, really short, we've got to get better data and disaggregated data at national and city level for transport, for transport planners, because at the moment they're using a misaligned com compass to plan the transport systems. They don't have the right information, and so they're not making the right decisions. But, so here, here we are in COP, and we've had some terrible extremes of climate in the Caribbean just recently. Mm -hmm. You know, this, turn it on its head. Let's make this a fantastic opportunity to put in place sustainable transport. So Gail doesn't have to say, mm, I'm not sure where there's any that's really, really good. We can say, well, every single island out in the Caribbean, they didn't build the same old stuff again. They built new, fantastic, sustainable carbon networks. For all. For all. <laughs> exactly. Truly, for all. <laughs> okay. I think I should, I should clarify, um, I realized that we didn't really say this in the beginning, is what is our area of, of work and where we are from? Because I, I am yes, from I'm so a particular sorry. resource constrained developing world city. So my, my perspective is from that particular angle. So when I struggle to find examples, it's within, within my particular context. You're from and South Africa, yeah. you should explain, yeah. And so to answer the, the, the question, again, from that resource-constrained developing world city, what, what I would like to see 
is that considering that we have multiple unmet mobility needs as well as every other need in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in its entirety, that we are more careful in interrogating the infrastructure heavy kind of big promise interventions that we are being um, uh, that have been suggested that we implement in our cities, that we that we interrogate the promises that those interventions offer and look at the evidence to see whether they in fact do deliver on those equity promises. And so before we we plan and implement these fin mostly financially unsustainable interventions, we we look more carefully at the transport systems that we already have. We in in southern African cities already about 60 to 80 percent of trips are made by public transport. So we don't have a challenge of moving people onto public transport, we have a challenge with the public transport we have. So within our limited kind of fiscal environment that we, that we consider incrementally upgrading the transport we have before we implement infrastructure heavy corridor based new projects that then provide perhaps a dramatically different um, transport experience for people in one corridor and then in 10 years time when we come to do the next corridor we have no more money so an incremental upgrade of what we have would ensure that we have better and more sustainable mobility for everyone rather than then substantially different mobility for a smaller group of people that was a long answer <laughs> <laughs> that's all right very thoughtful answer thank you sebastian Yes, with the European Youth Forum, we just recently had a training to make sure that young people were aware of what we could do ourselves to be active, be advocates against climate change. And I thought that was an amazing opportunity to see, real, uh, see realize that young people themselves were able to do such great things. So something that we are doing is making sure that young people, especially our members, are able to do great things. And that would also be my closing message for the partnership, make sure that you enable young people to do great things because we are 50% of the world population. We're not only the future, but we are the present and we are here to help because we have a really big interest in combating climate change. You, absolutely, the biggest. So. <laughs> absolutely, thank you so much and I hope you do feel empowered. I'm so grateful that you came and were able to join us today as well as both of you. Really, your expertise is super valuable and we need you, so uh, thank you for your work. Um, do we have um, any questions from the audience tonight? And uh, we do have one, great, and then we'll, um, yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Henry Goodmanson. I come from Denmark, from Copenhagen. I work in a climate think tank on transport issues. Uh, and I would really like to thank the panel for their contributions here in bringing out the topic of, of accessibility and access as being sort of behind transport and being in the essence of what we are, need to look for. And I think that is the context of my question as well, because I'm, I'm sort of wondering to what extent um, we can solve those uh, problems generated by transport within the transport sector. I mean, we can agree that transport creates a lot of challenges and a lot of problems, uh, and we need to find solutions. But if we're talking about access, maybe the transport system cannot deliver that in itself. So maybe I wonder if you would agree that we would need somewhat broader partnerships, bringing in cities, urban planners, uh, mayors, people with some charge in structuring our uh, physical environment uh, and to, to, to address sort of the uh, accessibility challenge. Also, we hear that some of the innovations are also coming from outside the transport sector. So maybe the partnership should be broad uh, and not just focus on transport, but also on solutions provided by uh, those who have uh, innovations and urban planning as responsibilities. Good, very good question, and, and it sort of included a solution or offer of a solution within it. Um, could everyone hear that? I think so. Yeah? Okay, so uh, any thoughts on that? Well, there's a very short answer, which is yes. <laughs> 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 that, that really was, was the point I was making in the beginning about, about how we, it needs to be a holistic intervention because if our problem is access, then we need to ensure that people have, have access 
via the transport system to what it is they w that they want to have access to. And that would usually be, as we were talking about earlier, healthcare or education or economic opportunities, community, whatever it might be. But those are not, those are not services that, are, that fall within the authority of the transport sector. Sometimes well, in Cape Town, the, the land use department and the transport department have just merged in the local government. So spatial planning, land use management and transport are now part of one authority, which I think is a very good way to go. Good example. I, can, I, I echo that entirely. The first step is actually not to look for new shiny solutions uh, from outside. It's actually to get city departments to talk and work with each other. That would already be a step to improve connectivity and accessibility. Uh, because if you get the transport people, the education and the health guys and housing, land use all working together, you can make a fantastic difference. Um, and it doesn't need anything new and shiny from the outside. Eh? Absolutely. Yeah? I almost, uh, I almost completely agree. There's almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> uh, there's one little thing that I disagree with, and I think we need strong governments setting high ambition goals mm. and then rally everyone around. Because if you start with rallying everyone around, it starts to be complicated, everyone's having their own interests, and it can happen that you get nowhere. I'm taking an example from my own hometown, Utrecht. We have a very ambitious local government and they're doing an amazing job. And basically we just opened the world's biggest bicycle storage center. So you can go there and like literally thousands and thousands of bicycles are coming there. They are setting the goals, they are being ambitious. And furthermore, by being ambitious, then they're saying, okay, but how we are going to reach those ambitions, we're going to do that together. Yes, so yeah. I think we need strong governments for strong ambitious. But then indeed, do it together. Mm. That's a very good point about making sure that there's sort of a core high ambition objective that everyone is rallying around and but cross ministerial cooperation, cross department and administration as well as vertical communication between city, state, region, etc. is very, very important. Really good point. Um, and a real concrete example of this I wanted just to, for those of us, you know, maybe not in uh, you know, this can be policy wonkish, is, you know, you're talking about a rural, com you know, you're talking about a suburban or underdeveloped community in, a, in an urban area. They don't have access to a lot of fruits and vegetables. They open a farmer's market. I, I know this from personal experience. They open a farmer's market, they're trying to increase the amount of live, fresh food in that area, yet they open it in an area where there's no way to get to it, actually. It's, it's a vacant lot, so it's low, it's accessible. Sure, they've talked to the, de you know, the Department of, you know, uh, uh, no, not of transport. They're not talking to transport. That's the whole point. They've, t <laughs> they've talked to the zoning department so they can have a farmer's market there. They've got everything lined up, but there's no bus stop there. So where are their customers? How are people going to actually get there? So that, that sort of like, how are you going to make it really useful for a community to connect, to connect and, and become an economically viable social just, you know, address social justice, et cetera. Make transportation useful for a community. Um, and to change the transport routes can take three years. And meanwhile, the one vacant lot where the farmer's market can, mm. can become is, is, you know, you're going to lose your farmer's market that brought fruits, fresh fruit into this community that really, that they had one stop and shop. So, um, and this is in a post-hurricane area. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's, these are real issues. They do need to talk to each other. So really, really, con I hope that's a concrete example. Um, excellent points. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Re uh, realities on the ground, inspiration. I hope we do enough work for the next generation. We're all trying our hardest. Um, I want to quickly, before you depart, um, say the next talk show themes. Uh, tomorrow night we have financing transportation. So money, money of course, <laughs> is involved. On Friday we have e-mobility, cutting edge topic there, and innovation on transportation. Saturday is the thematic day on transportation. So we won't have a talk show on Saturday and Sunday, but Monday we'll be reconvening and actually bringing back messages from the weekend and sort of a celebrating uh, transportation and, and bring back highlights from the weekend. And then we have more throughout the week to bring to the end, including some really great speakers at the end of the week. So. We'll tease you with that. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. And remember, hashtag we are transport. I should have mentioned it again throughout today. But ask questions online, and then we can get to them tomorrow as well. Thanks, guests. Thanks, everybody.